Hey everyone, welcome into this first lecture on hyperbolic trigonometry, this introduction lecture. So to start this introduction, I'd first like to remind us of the geometric definitions of the uh, regular trig functions. So in other words, I mean the unit circle definitions. So let's start with a unit circle, remind ourselves what the equation is, x squared plus y squared equals 1. And then let's choose a point on the unit circle. I'll pick one in quadrant 1 here, say this point. This point obviously has xy coordinates which obey the equation, right? They satisfy this equation, x squared plus y squared equals 1. And if we now construct or make the angle that opens from the positive x-axis, which I didn't label, I should have labeled, x-axis here, y-axis here, then what we do is we define these trig functions, our standard trig functions, to be um, the x-coordinate of this point to be the cosine of the angle theta, and the y coordinate to be the sine of the angle theta. Now, this is not the only way to do this, right? So this is this is the angle that we that we know very well. But another way to do this is to instead of using the angle, we can use the area of this little region here. And so let's say that the area of this is is the Greek letter tau instead of um, instead of theta. So tau here equals the area of this is called a sector of the circle. It's the area of this sector. It's obviously related to the arc length, right? And the arc length is actually related to the angle. So remember that the area, I won't go through the whole setup because this should be review, but the area of the unit circle um, traces out, starts at zero, right? But as you trace out the circle, the area goes from zero out to pi. And the formula for the area of a circle is one half r squared theta as theta varies from 0 to 2 pi. So the area is related to the angle, right? But with the unit circle, what's the radius? The radius of the unit circle is 1, right? So in this case, our tau, which is the area for this exact circle, this is this formula here is the area of any sector of a circle. So our tau is actually just equal to 1 half theta in this uh, scenario here, right? And tau, therefore, goes from 0 to pi, and we can then define our trig functions in terms of the area instead of um, using the angle itself. So I'm going to write this just below here because we're going to, you know, this might be weird. You're probably wondering, Justin, why are you doing this? This is, we, we understand trig, right? We remember trig in terms of the angle. Why are you switching this to make the, the trig functions be in terms of the area of the sector? Well, um, here's the reason. We want to now switch out this circle, this unit circle, for a hyperbola, a unit hyperbola. So again, let me write this over here, just so we know. This is a unit circle. We want to swap this out now for a unit hyperbola. All right, well, what's the difference? The equation of a unit hyperbola is very similar, but different, right? So it's x squared minus y squared equals 1. And so let's sketch this hyperbola, and then we'll make a definition that hopefully, with setting it up in this light, uh, makes it kind of obvious. So the unit hyperbola goes through this point, x equals 1, y equals 0, and then it opens out away, and it's got a like a reflected branch, a symmetric branch over here on this side. And so there's the graph of our unit hyperbola, these two arms. We're going to focus just on, the, on this one, the one that's in quadrants 1 and 4. And here's what we want to do. We want to do the same exact thing that we did with the unit circle. We want to define, okay, so given this point, x and y, these two points obey, uh, sorry, sorry, these two coordinates, the x and the y coordinate have to obey the equation of the unit hyperbola. That's what it means to be a point on the curve, right? And then we want to try to define some trigonometric-like functions over here. Now, they can't be cosine and sine anymore because it's not a circle. The other thing that happens here is that the... Um, that um, hopefully we remember about hyperbolas is that hyperbolas approach this is a standard hyperbola, right? So these two hyperbolas, they approach these lines y equals x and y equals minus x as asymptotes, right? As asymptotes. So um, we, we studied this with the hyperboloids in three dimensions that they're, they're asymptotic to cones, right? Same thing here. These are asymptotic to these lines. And so the reason I'm saying this is because if we tried to define anything with, to do with this point with respect to an angle, we wouldn't have this property that the angle can just go round and round. You know, the domain would be very restricted because the domain of the angle would be from 0 to pi over 4, 
um, and, pi and pi over 4 would not be included actually because it's an asymptote. So instead we, we want to be able to get all these points and we want the domain of whatever our hyperbolic functions end up being. We want that domain to be all real numbers and so we do exactly this. We, we use this idea of using the area because as as our point moves out the hyperbola, the area in this direction will continue to grow. All right, and so let's call the area of this region tau. Notice I'm trying to color code everything so it looks exactly the same. The only difference here is the shape, and that, that's kind of my point, right? That's the point that I'm trying to make here. And now what we can't do is make any definition with theta itself. Um, so we're going to define our hyperbolic trig functions to be cosh, so cosh means cosine hyperbolic of tau is the x-coordinate, and cinch, which is sine hyperbolic of tau, is the y-coordinate. I need a little more room. So sine hyperbolic, or cinch, of tau is the y-coordinate. All right, and so that's exactly the definition. That's the geometric definition. So the, the x-coordinate is the cosine hyperbolic, or the cosh of tau, and tau here geometrically is the area enclosed between the angle and the arc itself of the hyperbola. So it's not the triangle, right? The triangle would drop down here. This is the arc of the hyperbola, and then the base, the x-coordinate. All right, so obviously we get one identity because if the x is um, the x is cosh and the y is cinch, they have to obey this formula for the hyperbola, right? And this is like a hyperbolic Pythagorean theorem in some sense. I'm not sure I should say it that way, but cosh squared of tau minus cinch squared of tau is equal to 1. All right, so this is a defining property of cosh and cinch just based on um, the way that we've built this in terms of the geometry of the hyperbola, right? But this is a defining property. Now we're going to use this because as of right now, you know, this is great in some sense. We have this geometric picture of what it means to be hyperbolic co cosine cosh and hyperbolic sine cinch. Um, but we don't really have formulas that we can do calculus with. And of course, that's, that's what we want to do. We want to do calculus with these things. So I'm just going to give us some formulas for these, and we are going to have to check that they actually work. And so how are we going to check it? We are going to plug into this formula, all right? Um, so I'm just going to call this little subsection formulas. And the formulas are the following. Cosh of tau. We're going to switch this to an x in a minute. But cosh of tau is equal to the average of e to the tau plus e to the minus tau. So average is, is one half then, e to the tau plus e to the minus tau. And then cinch of tau is one half e to the tau minus e to the minus tau. And if we believe this, or if we want to believe that these are truly the cosh and the cinch that we claimed, right, then these two formulas better obey this formula, right? And so that's what we have to check. And if, if we do obey this formula, if we can show that the difference of the squares of these is truly equal to 1, um, then we will, we will have, we'll, we'll believe these formulas, right? Because they, they obey our defining property. So let's do it. Let's start with cosh squared tau. This, of course, means square the whole formula, just like with cosine and sine. This is cosh of tau squared. And so this is 1 half e to the tau plus e to the minus tau quantity squared. So this is 1 fourth. And then we have to FOIL this, right? When you square e to the tau, you get e to the 2 tau. When you multiply e to the tau times e to the minus tau, you get e to the 0, or 1, right? And then there's two copies of those, so there's a plus 2. And then uh, we get a plus e to the minus 2 tau. So that's just by carefully FOILing this. And now when you sub out for cinch instead of cosh, you're going to see, I'm going to skip forward a little bit here, but cinch squared tau is equal to all the same stuff. At this point here, there's a minus sign instead, right? So what's that going to result in? If you do all the same calculation but with a minus here, it's going to give you 1 fourth e to the 2 tau minus 2, that's where the minus comes in, and then plus again because you square it. So plus e to the negative 2 tau. And remember, our job was to subtract these, right? We need to figure out what this equals. So cosh squared tau minus cinch squared tau is equal to, we'll, we can factor out the 1 fourth, 0, so e to the 2 tau minus itself, those are going to cancel, 2 minus negative 2, so plus 2 minus negative 2, uh, plus e to the 2 tau, mi negative 2 tau minus e to the negative 2 tau. 
All right, and so I'm writing this all out, but these two cancel, these two cancel, these two combine to be a positive four, but look what we've got outside here. One fourth of four is one. All right, so what this tells us then is we've, we've worked this out, right? We defined these functions geometrically. We wrote down a formula and verified that that formula obeys the geometric uh, defining equation. And so therefore, what we found is that our functions, I'm going to swap out tau for x now because we're going to do calculus. So we're going to think of x here. Um, I'm jumping the gun. We, what we want then, what we found is that cosh of x is equal to 1 half e to the x plus e to the minus x. And cinch of x is equal to 1 half e to the x minus e to the minus x. And from there, you can build all the other hyperbolic trig functions the same way you would uh, with trig, regular trig functions in, in calculus class, right? And you can define something like tanch of x, which we will use all the time. This is cinch of x divided by cosh of x. And then you can define all the rest of them. Um, usually, we'll stick with these three. All right, what I want to do now is try to plot the graphs of these things. And then we'll end this video. But plot the graphs of the functions y equals cosh of x and y equals cinch of x. All right, so just those two we'll plot for now. All right, so we need to, I want to do this so that we can still see that. So I'll, I'll just try to draw the graphs here and then we'll deal with it. So these two functions are built out of building block functions, e to the x and e to the minus x, right? So I'm going to start with the 1 half, I'm going to distribute the half. 1 half e to the x and 1 half e to the minus x. So those functions are going to go through a height of 1 half, both of them. So after they've been halved, 1 half e to the x we know has a graph that looks like this. I'm just sketching this, it's not going to be perfect. But there's 1 half e to the x. And 1 half e to the minus x is going to just be the same shape, but reflected, right? And not touching the x-axis. So asymptote doesn't touch right there. Use your imagination. And it does this. So these are supposed to be perfect reflections of each other. Um, you can decide if they are or not. And then to build our cosine function, our, our hyperbolic cosine, cosh function, what do we have to do? Well, for every x value, that's every input value on the x coordinate line, we have to add together the heights of these two functions, right? So the, the, along the y-axis, it's easy because it's 1 half plus 1 half. They have the same height, so that means we end up at a height of 1, right? So cosh of 0 should be 1. As you move over, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to go up to the orange one, and you're going to add on to that. You're going to add on the height of the pink one or the magenta one. So you're going to take this height add it on right there, that same height. And as you keep going over in the x direction, you go up to the orange one and you add on the height of the magenta one, but look at the height of the magenta one is becoming less and less, right? What, what if you go to the left? You slide over here, I'll just do one like say right here. You go up to the uh, up to the orange one, I got my colors miscoded here, up to the orange one, which is this, right? And then you go up to the magenta one and you add that on, right? So actually, what should I add on here? I should add on this much, right? All right, and so then all these points at the end points here, these are all the points that lie on the graph of cosh of x. So this thing ends up looking like, and by the way, it's going because these get pinched down, the actual exponential curves in both directions, because they get pinched down as you go out, then our curve is going to be uh, asymptotic to one half e to the x and one half e to the minus x in, in either direction. But it, it's actually like a really smooth looking, almost like a parabola. It's not a parabola, but something like that. That's the graph of y equals cosh of x. All right, how are we going to build the graph of cinch of x? Well, we have to do the same kind of, of thinking, right? Same kind of thinking, except at every step when we go up to the to the orange graph with the red line, we're going to have to subtract off, subtract off, right? Subtract off these blue heights from the magenta curve. So let's see what happens. Uh, what color should we use? Let's use dark blue. So first of all, um, when you do 1 half minus 1 half, now you're going through the origin, right? So this is our cinch function goes through the origin. And then at each point, it's going to go up to the orange, but then back down, back down that blue amount, right? 
up here and then back down just a little bit. And same thing as we go over here, we go up to the orange, but then we're going to go down in the other direction by the length of this one, right? And I'm just, I'm just kind of um, approximating here, but the idea is that on the left hand side, you're taking the orange height, subtracting off the bigger magenta height, and so you're going to be down here below, below the x-axis. Over here, you're going to be above the x-axis, but below the orange exponential curve. And so from this side, it approaches asymptotically from the bottom, and then from this side, it does this. All right, and so this blue graph here is y equals sinh of x. Notice these graphs are very different than the sine and cosine graphs that we're used to for regular trig. Um, because they're built out of exponentials and, and so they're the hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. But these are their graphs. You can try to think about what would happen with tanch now, right? So what's tanch going to be? Tanch is going to be the heights of the cinch divided by the heights of cosh and so you can you can imagine what that one's going to do uh, and as an exercise you should try to sketch that one. Um, I'm going to leave this video here but these are the geometric definitions of cinch and cosh, cosh and cinch. We have an algebraic definition now, right here, right, a, that we can use, a function definition, a formula that we can use to compute stuff. And then we have the graphs here um, that we can visualize the graphs of cinch and cosh on the y-x axis or the x-y axis.